Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us for a discussion on the challenge of setting democratic ground rules for artificial intelligence. Over the past year, remarkable progress in the capabilities of large language models has catapulted AI into public debates and onto the agendas of national governance and international institutions. These conversations reflect a growing awareness that, while digital advances hold out real promise in many areas of life, from medical research to investigative journalism, their impact on democratic principles can't be taken for granted. Like other technologies, AI advances are a double-edged sword. They can help independent reporters or anti-corruption watchdogs to make sense of critical information and share it with the public, but they can also amplify societal bias or undermine due process. They can make it harder to tell fact from fiction or lay the foundations for a surveillance state. In light of this urgent challenge, the International Forum for Democratic Studies convened a workshop in Buenos Aires, Argentina, to discuss what civil society can do to more intentionally embed democratic norms in AI development. That means developing rules for AI that reflect principles like transparency, accountability, and equality, but also creating opportunities for meaningful democratic participation in the governance of AI systems. In our, no, in our new thought paper, Setting Democratic Ground Rules for AI, the forum's Beth Curley has assembled some overarching themes and key highlights from that discussion. While much of the conversation in AI and democracy is focused specifically on how generative AI tools are pumping new types of content into the information space, this report takes a wider view, looking not just at chatbots, but also at facial recognition software, tools that can help make sense of government data and systems that automate decision-making. Through this lens, the report addresses how AI systems are impacting human rights, changing the landscape for civic activism, and impacting the work of civil society organizations dedicated to traditional issues of democracy and human rights. It shares what our participants saw as major roadblocks to democratic involvement in AI governments and governance and concrete forward-looking strategies for civil society organizations thinking about how to uphold democratic values in a world where AI systems will increasingly help to shape societal and political landscapes. The governance of artificial intelligence is one of the cross-cutting transnational challenges that are demanding adaptation and innovation by democratic activists and societies. In order to meet the moment, the democracy community and its civil society partners will need to do more to foster the sustained sharing of knowledge and experience across regional and sectoral boundaries. They will need to raise awareness and deepen engagement in society at large, embedding digital development in the vibrant give and take of open democratic debate. Finally, they will need to create meaningful, durable incentives to counter the pull of authoritarian digital trajectories which can all too easily prevail when levers pushing on behalf of democratic principles are absent. In a context of global democratic backsliding and rising authoritarian influence, the potential abuse of AI technologies presents grave risks to democracy. So too do thoughtless deployments of these technologies where the temptation to see them as a substitute for engaging with neighbors or constituents. A network response drawing on the reservoirs of knowledge and experience within the global community of Democrats is critical to steer us towards a better, a better digital trajectory. In today's conversation, Beth Curley, who has done such outstanding work to tease out the ideas in this report, will be sharing key takeaways from the paper in a conversation with two of our workshop participants, Natalia Carfi, Executive Director of the Open Data Charter, and Eduardo Carrillo, Executive Direct Co-Director of the Paraguayan digital rights organization, TEDICH, mod moderated by, very pleased he's with us, Ryan Heath of Axios. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank the team here for their great work. This includes Maya Reconati, John Engelkin, Amaris Rancy, John Glenn, Kevin Shives, and of course, Beth Curley, who oversaw the production of this report. Now I'd like to turn things over to Ryan Heath. Thank you, Ryan. Thanks so much, Chris. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you wherever you are in the world uh, tuning in today. Beth, 
maybe I can start with you since you've been uh, so critical to pulling the report together. In the report, um, you call or you you represent the need for democratic ground rules for AI. And I thought maybe you could sort of level set us here. Um, we've all been thinking about chatbots in 2023, but can you walk us through a little bit uh, the various types of systems that need these ground rules? And is this a case of needing principles that can be applied in a lot of different settings? Or do you really mean we need to see some hard legislation put through by governments around the world? Yes, absolutely. So um, first of all, uh, thanks so much. Really exciting to be here um, and really exciting to share out the fascinating um, recommendations that we were able to gather from our stellar group of participants at the Buenos Aires workshop. So I really appreciate your asking about the different types of systems in play, because I think, well, it's true that there has been amazing progress in the area of LLMs. It's also true that AI really means so much more than just chatbots and all of these technologies, whether these are facial recognition cameras, whether these are automated decision making systems that government bureaucracies use, whether these are labor management tools or social media algorithms, all of these things have potential impacts on our ability to exercise our democratic rights on the vibrancy of the civic landscape and ultimately on the balance of power between people and governments. These tools give people who use them and also people who design them in different ways, ways to kind of circumscribe the options that people are encounter in terms not only of how we look at information, but also in terms of how we interact with institutions like government bureaucracies that are really fundamental to people's enjoyment of their democratic and human rights. And there are ways in which these changes could be very hopeful. So for instance, machine learning underpins some cutting edge anti-corruption work. It can be used by investigative journalists to make sense of data sets um, or to automate routine work and free up bandwidth for original reporting. But there's also a lot of really dystopian potential as we see with arrests in Russia of protesters after the fact using facial recognition tools or the profile of individuals for the pieces of the social credit system in the People's Republic of China and to an even more horrifying degree um, against the weaker population uh, through the iJob platform that Human Rights Watch has reported on. Um, there was just recently a study showing how large language models, in addition to producing text, can draw inferences about people's personal attributes based on anonymous things that they post online, which threatens the ability of people in repressive settings to take advantage of the digital space as a place to speak out and challenge the authoritarian consensus. So all of these things are impacts of AI on democracy and human rights coming from a lot of different directions. And I also want to stress that what matters here isn't just what AI can actually do, but what people think it can do, right? Because sometimes, as for instance, with false arrests, um, especially of Black people based on facial recognition cameras, which is unfortunately a challenge that we've seen in many different settings, um, it's, it, the risk comes from agencies overestimating what their tools are capable of. Similarly, when decisions are automated to systems that are seen as objective without paying enough attention to the human decisions that fed into how those tools were designed, to the social inequalities that fed into data sets. Um, and even when people themselves who are in a setting where AI tools are being used, for instance, overestimate what surveillance technologies and public spaces are capable of and so modify their own behavior because they think they're being watched. And for that reason, I think um, it's really important for civil society and democratic institutions to be more engaged in AI governance in a few different fronts. One, fostering a more precise understanding of exactly what AI technologies can and cannot do so that they can be deployed in a more intentional way that takes account of their impacts on democratic principles like transparency, accountability, and equality. Um, and But also to set up guardrails. And there, I think you really need a spectrum of types of guardrails, right? I think in some settings, um, legislation may be one response to this, um, obviously depending on the institutions of the particular 
um, country and the ability of civil society to engage on that particular front. Um, but also, I think it's very important to have um, opportunities at different levels for ongoing engagement by the public and by civil society in conversations about how specific AI tools are being developed and deployed because this is really the intersections of AI and society are very complex and very nuanced and I think you really need that on the ground perspective about each individual case to inform these kinds of decisions. Thanks, Beth. Um, if I bring in Natalia and Eduardo now, at one level, um, it seems to me that AI has been uh, in use for quite a while now in a number of different settings. Uh, so it's not strictly speaking new, uh, but it may be that people didn't realize that AI was being deployed in their society or by their government and other institutions. So I was wondering from your perspective um, uh, in Latin America, is this something that you feel um, the 2023 debate has opened up new opportunities to try and have more democratic discourse? Or is it a case that uh, now there is just an onslaught of AI that is sort of happening at your societies rather than uh, a case of being able to open up the discussion? Maybe I'll, I'll turn to you first, Natalia. Thank you very much. And that's a, a great question. And uh, and this is something that we actually discussed uh, in in the workshop here in, in Buenos Aires earlier this this year. Um, we've seen AI systems being being developed and being deployed both by governments and and, and private sector, but also um, somehow with with civil society organizations. The the discussions, the global discussions on principles and governance of, of AI, of ethical use of AI, have mainly come from what is called the, the global north. Um, so it's been an advocating effort for civil society organizations based on, on the global south or the global majority uh, to actually be able to participate in those, in those ad advocating uh, efforts in global forums. So there's, there's many discussions happening at the same time. There's a discussion on, on AI in, in IGF that just happened in, in Japan. There is also the UN Digital Compact discussing AI. Uh, there's ITU also efforts on discussing um, principles for AI, UNESCO's uh, effort on discussing on discussing principles on AI. So it's it's getting really complicated for civil society organizations to be able to be actually be there to discuss those those uh, those principles because those principles are actually going to be the ones that will run um sorry that will lead the um, the reg regulations that will come into place in 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 our in our countries. Um, so one of the main efforts that the Open Data Charter has been trying to do is actually uh, be kind of a hub to bring in visions from from uh, different civil society organizations and uh, and also set up uh, core ideas that we want these forums to hear. So that uh, if we are there, we can actually uh, tell the participants these these core ideas that that uh, broader civil society organization community agrees on but also know that we will be represented if we are not uh, we are not able to be there in person so that our core ideas the ones that we discuss with with the global community are are there being heard um it's been it's been complicated and i think it's going to get even more complicated as the forums keep on discussing these principles on ethical AI, on responsible AI. Uh, but one of the things that I that I talked about in, in the workshop, and I think it's also important, is we might be forgetting that we need to also bring up the discussion around data and democratic uh, governance of, of data. Uh, AI systems are based on, on data, and we're still not getting the data governance frameworks right. Uh, so we also need to bring back that conversation in order to be able to work on on democratic principles of of AI. And uh, and I've been saying this in every forum that I've been able to participate. Uh, we really need to focus uh, our our efforts on on data infrastructure, on data governance, so that we can thoroughly talk about democratic AI in in our region. I see you nodding there, Eduardo. Um, it, you know, it's a reminder of what Natalia is saying that the golden rule in AI is if you don't put quality representative data into a system, you're not going to get a quality democratic outcome from it. Um, tell me why you were nodding, um, and, and, and I'll let you answer the questions as well. 
Yeah, yeah. Well, <clears throat> I, I fully agree with pretty much everything that Natalia has said. Um, just to go back to the beginning of, 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 your, of your question, I think that at the moment in Global South context, uh, regulation or uh, discussions happening at us or with us, it's not a one or other option. It's sort of like a mix of both. There's definitely and definitely 2023 and the technological advance, advancements, the public ones at least, that we have seen uh, have helped to sort of like install the necessity to discuss what is the implications of the technology in our everyday lives and for democracy in general. So I would say that definitely uh, it's an interesting opportunity for civil society organizations and other stakeholders to exploit in a way in order to introduce and make sure that the debate goes towards a human rights and human centric discussion rather than perhaps an economical and digital economy kind of uh, interest that we are seeing in some countries and in some regions here in the in the global south like ai as an opportunity to further develop jobs and so on um at the same time i would say that discussions are happening at us uh because the implications of these technologies and uh, the leapfrogging for our countries is huge meaning that and that doesn't necessarily come accompanied with a leapfrogging of institutional capacity to understand how this technology works and more importantly how to regulate it and how to deal with the consequences if there were to be consequences that are negative or even a discussion of how the institutions can create safeguards for those uh, negative implications not to happen in the first place so i would say that uh, to, to 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 jump on Natis that last point the discussion on data is not enough uh, and, and, and it's getting a bit lost. A lot of the discussions from interest of legislators in regulating this or creating national plans is very much around AI and you know, chat GPT and what that means for our society and so on. But they don't necessarily do the questions around, okay, how are our institutions around data protection, for instance? And we're in a context like the Paraguayan one where we don't even have a comprehensive personal data protection law, let alone an independent agency that foresees the compliance of, 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 of a data protection law. We are not even in a context where uh, open data has given or has proved the full benefits that has posed or has promised uh, in the last year. And we have seen a lot of progress uh, in the Paraguayan country in terms of access to public information uh, development and use of open data by communities, but still the quality of data from governments is not enough, not even close to being what it needs to be. Data protection legislation is also insufficient, even in countries who already have a data protection uh, law. And here I'm thinking the examples of Brazil, Ecuador, who has recently passed one. Um, Argentina, who is currently debating how to improve its data protection law. So we're in a way caught by this urgency of um, adopting AI, of governments and states feeling the pressure of saying that they're doing things. And this is something that is also touched upon in the, in the report. There is this need from states of showing in a way that uh, they are adopting technology and that they're being innovative. And I think that everyone can in a way um, understand that sentiment but at the same time we need to understand the implications of adopting this technology and also the obligations that states have in ensuring human rights compliance and the different treaties that they are part of so um there's like overlapping discussions happening at the same time and institutional uh weaknesses and depths from the state in how regulation of technology should look like that are 10 years or even 15 years behind than what the actual needs are. And now we're seeing the situation where, where AI sort of like introduces itself in that institutional precarity. And it's a challenge that we need to keep in mind whenever we're thinking about how to, as civil society, accompany discussions of how AI regulation should look like in, a, in our context. And with this, I mean, and I'll finish with this, uh, we need to, of course, make sure that we insert all ourselves in these processes and make sure that whatever regulation comes is the best possible one.
But at the same time, we must not forget the institutional depths that we have uh, around data protection, around open data, around access to information uh, that are crucial and that are a first step, actually, that should be taken in our context. Yeah, it's there are many layers here to, to unpack that idea of institutional debt in these technical debates is a really important one, I think, because government and uh, democratic institutions are always struggling to keep up with the technical innovation. But it becomes even more important with AI because you start to face questions about how to ensure that humans remain in control and you're constantly fighting this uh, tendency to think, oh, well, it's a very technical topic, so technical experts should be in charge of it rather than a broader discussion that involves non-technical experts who also have a stake in the, the situation. So with those thoughts in mind, I thought maybe um, we can talk, uh, unpack a little bit this question of how do you uh, not just keep humans in the loop, but what are the most effective arguments for getting civil society at the table, let's say. So, so Beth, to bring it back to you, one of the things I love in the report is this emphasis of humans and their role in AI. Um, you know, the AI can't exist without us. Uh, only people can be accountable. Machines, at least for now, cannot be accountable. Um, and, and, and that's something we always try and infuse into our reporting at, at, at Axios. So I was wondering, sort of, can you elaborate a little bit for us, sort of, how the human dimension can help us to understand and use AI better. Yes, absolutely. So, I mean, I think there's two sides to that, which I really appreciate the way you asked that question. First, there's the fact that AI systems actually, regardless of whether or not we're intentionally thinking about this, involve human choices and human structures at so many different levels. And then there's the question of, if that's true, how can we be a little more intentional in terms of how we think about responsibility and participation um, in those processes? Um, because I think we're going to see more and more cases, whether this is in government decision making, in the workplace, um, in the way we, I mean, it's already true, right, in the way we decide what information surfaces to the top, where there is a decision that's supposedly made by a machine, but actually there was a human who made a decision about data selection, there was a human who made a decision about data labeling, who made a decision about design, refinement, about buying a model, about deploying a model. Um, and basically the AI systems just helps those different people, maybe without all being aware of one another, to turn human inputs into human outputs. So if we're going to embed these systems at junctures that affect our rights, we have to be thinking, how do we assign responsibility at different points along this chain? Um, and I, this was uh, something our group had very strong feelings about. We had one participant who basically just said, I don't like the term, you know, accountable AI, responsible AI, because yeah, the AI system itself um, is not where accountability lies. And that's a dodge, right? That's a dodge for companies. That's a dodge for governments. And I think what we need to do is make sure that the AI technologies that we use can provide an enhancement without providing a dodge. So ultimately, at the end of the day, there is someone who can be held responsible. Um, and I think um, in some of these intersections, like the ways in which data sets can introduce biases into models are pretty well known. I think the public conversation has maybe focused a little bit less on things like decision-making around the procurement of AI technologies by governments, um, but this is something that the forum has been looking at a lot in our making tech transparent work, um, which I think is quite significant because sometimes looking at, for instance, relationships between governments and vendors of surveillance technologies can help us understand the logic behind those tools getting deployed in certain areas, not on others. And then finally, there's the question of um, the way context influences how systems work, right? And that could be on a very basic level. So when we have um, people we talk to who are actually trying to use AI for pro-democratic ends, they emphasize this off-the-shelf tool is not necessarily going to work if we don't have the right data infrastructure in place, but it also means that there can be unexpected harms. For instance, if you take a tool that was developed in a setting with strong data governance frameworks and a lot of public trust, and then put it in a setting where there's a history of the authorities abusing personal data for purposes of repression 
or discrimination. Um, and so in light of all of that, I think it's really important to I mean, first clarify these kind of intersections of human structures and human choices. And second, think about opportunities to broaden the group of people who know about them and the group of people who have an opportunity to actively participate. Um, and uh, Nadi might be able to tell you a little bit more about um, the question of how to broaden participation in the data side of this equation. Um, and But I think also um, you know, deepening public involvement in um, decision-making around AI purchases and in decisions around development and doing that at an earlier stage, right? At the beginning when these conversations start and not here's a tool or here's a law, what do you think about it? Um, I know that was something that was quite important to the group. Yeah, it really feels like we've we've got to be in at the ground level, whether that is responsibility or privacy or safety by design. You know, if you don't, if you if you don't get in at the first step, things get so much harder. Um, Nadi, what's worked for you? How how have you been most successful in getting to the table and, and having that sort of input at an early stage? Yeah, so Ryan, that's that's a great question. And the Open Data Charter has done a, a research project. We are actually uh, going to uh, introduce our, our final report on that uh, next month. Uh, but the idea was to try to understand and, and observe the application of AI in development challenges. And we, we researched on two specific domains in agriculture and, and healthcare in the global south. Um, we interviewed people developing AI systems in around 12 countries. So Argentina, Lesotho, South Africa, Ghana, Malawi, Colombia. It was like a really broad uh, broad, um, broad number of, of, of government of, sorry, of, of countries that we, we did this research, um, on in, and we actually found out that, um, as, as I, I guess it was somebody from, from Microsoft said, artificial intelligence is nor artificial nor intelligent. Um, so there's still a lot of need of data validation at the ground level, uh, bo both for agriculture and for health, uh, the, the biggest data sets that the, they were using for training their AI systems came from the global north, uh, and, and they needed to kind of reshape those data sets in order to make them um, representative of the, re of the realities that they were working on. Then on, on for example, on crops, uh, they needed to revalidate the data on the ground. So there was a lot of human uh, human uh, resources actually being used on the on the kind of revalidation of the huge data sets that, that they were using. Um, so it's still a pretty much human-centered, uh, centric data development system. And that's where the intelligent uh, layer kind of falls a little bit. Um, there's a lot of ecosystem challenges in the global south, dependency to external data systems like sensors or remote sen uh, sensing, and then a lot of mismatches as far as uh, time frames of the data sets that are being created. It's not kind of stable data that can be properly used to develop these, these AI systems. And it goes back to Edu Eduardo, Eduardo's point of like, we need to stay, take a step, uh, a step behind it and kind of re rethink about this. And then we also found out that there's a lot of infrastructural challenges. Uh, cloud computing remains costly, and we do need that for, for AI uh, development. Um, and then infrastructure challenges like band, ba broadband uh, access, equipment, skills, labor. Uh, there's still a lot that we need to unpack before we can we can fully um, fully kind of use or develop AI systems. And these are all things that do not have to do specifically with with governance or frameworks uh, or or. Uh, principles. This is like ground level discussions that we've had with people in, in these 12 countries. Um, and anyway, they were trying to develop AI systems anyway, to try to understand if they could, through AI development, um, yeah. work on 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 um, on trying to solve public problems or even trying to develop new businesses. That is a super interesting point, um, Eduardo. I'd love you to sort of um, give your perspective on it as well, because sitting here in the global north, one of my thoughts is, oh, OK, well, now we have open source models that are, are nearly as good as some of the best of these large language models. Surely that's a chance um, for people in the global south to catch up. But then Nadi has just pointed out all of the other 
infrastructure and cost layers that make it more complicated than my little thought here. You know, what, what does it feel like um, to you? And, and have you seen any examples of organizations in Paraguay or elsewhere sort of cracking this open and 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 saying, okay, now we are going to seize control of part of this AI agenda and build it ourselves? I think that's a very, very far debate uh, also for, for, for most of our regions uh, because uh, of these structural depths that, uh, and even technological uh, inequalities uh, from our global south realities and in relation to how global north has access to certain technologies and certain infrastructure to actually even develop um, these systems. Um, I was talking with some colleagues and they were saying that also who are, who are from the technical team and like saying like one of the biggest challenges that we have here in order to develop AI is also the fact that only a few countries in Latin America have access to supercomputers. Uh, that's another huge uh, structural uh, barrier for our own capacity to develop these sort of technologies, let alone issues around how many people have degrees in computer science and related and, and STEM related uh, disciplines. And then also we can bring in the debate also how many of those degrees are issued to women and how many of them are issued to men. And then how also that sort of like feeds this eternal loop that ends up um, extending inequality and reproducing bias in new and different ways. So I would say that a lot of the discussions right now uh, in some organizations in Latin America, definitely in Tadik as well, is how we can bring more diversity to these spaces, how we can ensure that women and girls are more involved in STEM disciplines and so on. And that is part of the debate around uh, how we can, or, or part of the long-term solution of how we can imagine a more equitable digital future that is not only designed uh, by men uh, in the global north, but also developed in the global south and not only by men in the global south, by all, but also from other diversities and other uh, realities um, and, and, and other vulnerable communities. But this is a very complicated and long-term uh, strategy that needs to start now or that actually should have started like 20 years ago, I would argue but that at least now we're in a position where we can uh, debate on these issues. But then other issues are, are, are quite worrying also from a, from a sovereignty standpoint, if, if you come to think about it, and, 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 a, and a lot of them have been already covered uh, by Nati, the cost of cloud computing, it's one aspect of it, but another one is that most of the cloud computing industry is controlled by, I think, three companies, if I'm not mistaken, all of them based in the global north and I think in the US. So that's also an interesting layer of complexity to analyze when thinking, where are we as Global South? And I'm thinking more in the Latin American context because it's the one that I'm more familiar with. Where are we in the Latin American context when thinking on developing our own AI tools, understanding by developing it, how it works and how we can mitigate harms from those uh, technologies. And then one last thing uh, to go back to the beginning of, uh, of your question and this concept of uh, human in the loop uh, to ensure uh, the mitigation of harms at different levels. I think it's an important discussion to, to have in mind, but also thinking in global south context, what kind of human in the loop uh, is enforced is a very crucial one because we are talking about an in the example perhaps of uh, public institutions incorporating AI for different purposes, human in the loop shouldn't be the only excuse that states use to guarantee that safeguards are in place and that uh, harms will not occur. Because I think there's like a broader question of where should we implement AI and where we shouldn't implement AI in the first place. And human in the loop is not enough uh, to, to to let's say wash or AI wash uh, the deployment of, of that technology in the public sector and in issues such as facial recognition for, for mm -hmm. security purposes, which is one that is very, I would argue, connected to the issue of democracy and AI, but also other issues such as uh, analysis of, uh, of, of judicial documents to further automate the way court rulings are um, produced and other uh, worrying examples, I would argue. Um, 
that, that, that should have much more debate before even actually implementing them. So, and, and I'll finish with this again. I think that we're very much caught also in a situation where governments are trying to justify why they are using AI, but yeah. not really doing the question of if they should use it in the first place. This is a really important point. And actually, I stick with you, Eduardo. We reverse the order for this, for this question. I think this is a really important moment to talk about uh, pushing back on authoritarian governments or authoritarian tendencies, even amongst democratically elected governments when it comes to AI. And I think we have all learned the hard way from the development of the internet and smartphones that authoritarian uses of technology, you know, it's, pr it's pretty easy to adapt a technology that has the potential for freedom to make sure it doesn't deliver that freedom. Um, what are some of the most effective ways that that you've pushed back against authoritarian or surveillance tendencies, Eduardo? Because, you know, it's absolutely right. Like you could have a human in the loop of um, a very repressive system and it's still a really <laughs> repressive system. That's a complicated question, I would say, uh, in, in terms of tangible examples, because it's a very difficult one, engaging with policymakers who are already implementing systems uh, and trying to force them to renounce to an acquisition that they have already made uh, that has happened in obscurity and so on. It's always complicated. I would say that a lot of the efforts in, in Latin America, and I'm, I'm thinking a lot of my colleagues that do similar work uh, in Tadik. In, in, in the region. A lot of the strategies that we have adopted or a very similar one is strategic litigation to try to understand, uh, firstly, how a specific technology that has an AI component is being deployed. And from there on, on the one hand, uh, aiming at the judicial power to actually even execute its interpretation muscle of how these technologies impact human rights in general. And from there, trying to, to, to build a narrative as to why um, this technology should be reversed or what kind of safeguards could potentially be um, adopted to better ensure human rights compliance. Uh, a lot of the strategic litigation that is currently happening in, religion, in the region is related to facial recognition technologies implementation in the public space, in borders, uh, even in stadiums, so then we're talking about different layers of actors who are implementing this technology and thus different strategic litigation uh, strategies coexisting at the same time. Some of them targeted to the private sector, some of them targeted to, to the public sector, all of them with the same goal of shedding light of how this technology works in the first place. But this sort of like connect us to, 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 to the broader structural depths that we have uh, both regulatory, both enforcement, and so on. Um, because at least in the, in the facial recognition example, for instance, uh, a lot of the, like the situation that in Paraguay ignited the, the, the need of a strategic litigation was because when we ask public information as to why a system was being uh, deployed and what were the technical specificities and who were the actors behind it, or request for information was denied on national security grounds. So that's sort of like the process that ignited us to counter back that narrative and counter back that denial of our request for, for public information and start a strategic litigation. So again, I feel like it's an endless loop uh, that we're caught at the moment uh, in the region that now AI itself itself and, and, and adds a new layer of complexity. And I would say that another one that perhaps for some might feel a bit basic, but I would argue it's not at all, is how uh, we as civil society, and especially I'm thinking to begin a lot, a lot of examples that we have here, we do have a very particular attention in developing capacities and co-developed capacities actually with journalists. We need to make sure that this alliance between civil society organizations and journalists uh, that cover technological issues and that have a voice in the public space have at least within their options of arguments when, when they're covering technology issues, the human rights aspect. Because now a lot of the, or, or, or most of the narrative in, in, in local news outlets and in, in local media, uh, and the traditional one at least, is very much uh, caught up in this idea of, yes, AI brings efficiency, 
uh, or digital technologies in general, I would even argue but to, to go even beyond AI brings efficiency and brings benefits to a population. Uh, and they don't necessarily go in depth into analyze the technological implications of adopting XYZ technology for a given purpose with more nuance and with human rights uh, as the core guiding uh, methodological framework to analyze it. Um, so I would say this could be, I would argue, two interesting examples that are already happening and that are actually mentioned in the report because a lot of the work that we do is synthesized uh, in that report, very likely, and for people to, 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 to know about it. Thank you. And Nadi, do you have um, any examples in your work of uh, institutions or countries where there just isn't that debate about, do we need this? And then we're already too stuck into pushing back or, or making it a slightly less worse version of the AI rather than, than deciding, do we actually democratically want this or not? So uh, it's a it's a good question, and I'm just gonna I think uh, double click on 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 Eduardo's points. Uh, so one of the one of the cases that is very well known here in in Buenos Aires city where I'm based um, has to do with the fugitive uh, facial recognition system that was set up by the Buenos Aires uh, city government, and then through strategic uh, strategic lit litigation, two civil society organizations were were able to make that system uh, be shut down. Um, and, and of course, I think this goes back to, to the comms bit of it. And we discussed this broadly in, uh, in, in the workshop. And I think it's important. Um, there were voices, uh, in, in citizens, uh, that, that were saying like, why do we want this to be shut down? Because, um, it, it brings in safety for us, because if, if something happens, uh, we will be able to, to see who did it and recognize them. So the comms bit of it. Uh, outside of the technical community of the most engaged community in these discussions is very important. And we really need to work harder on, on that um, because it seems like the broader citizenship knows about uh, AI systems that are already running when something goes wrong. Um, but then if not, there's like no news around it. Uh, governments are deploying AI systems and, and nobody actually knows about them. Uh, until something like it goes in major, like major newspapers or something, because it actually went wrong. Um, so we need, we also need to to work a lot on that, and that is something that that uh, from the open data charters uh, perspective is something that we want to work mo more on. Um, because as 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 I said, we come from the data community into the AI discussion, and and as we are a global civil society organization, we think we can add value to to that discussion. But this is something that we actually discussed a lot. And then one of the things that we also discussed in in the workshop, and I think it's an interesting proposal um, that I haven't seen implemented in in the global south so far. But maybe I'm I'm missing uh, I'm missing one iteration of this. Is the sandboxes um, example like like. Can we create a sandbox on, on an AI system before we deploy it and test out the good bits of it, the bad bits of it in a secured, uh, secured way before we actually deploy it, before uh, we make the decision that AI is actually uh, an AI system on AI development is actually the, the solution for, for a problem that we're trying to tackle. Uh, kind of AI should be the means towards an end and not the response uh, within itself. So maybe trying to set up this, if it's sandbox, this is a sandbox, if, like a secure testing environment where we can work on, on the regulatory framework, but also on, on the technical bit of it, the data bit of it, uh, before we actually make a full-on implementation that impacts citizens in ways that, that we do not know and have not seen. That's actually a really great point, and I haven't thought about it in those terms before, so maybe I'll just put you on the spot, Beth, and ask you about it. This idea of um, testing things before they're sort of used or inflicted upon people, you know, like, that, that's a very, that's a democratic principle, isn't it? That, you know, we should know whether things are safe and effective before they happen to us, rather than scramble to limit the damage after they happen to us. Is, 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 is that something that we really need to be investing more in um, with AI? Uh, uh, 
for, is that for Natty? Uh, no, for you, Beth. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, so, um, yes, I think absolutely getting, and I think that ties back to the earlier point, right, about what stage do you consult with stakeholders outside of the company or outside of the government agency. Um, it really does need to be when you're making basic choices, right, around design, around what um, sort of principles do you optimize for, what priorities do you have, what data do you include and exclude, um, because there's a real challenge when you have flaws that are kind of baked in at a deeper level, right? And then there's an attempt to make um, technical fixes, but the problems can resurface. So I think, um, yes, looking ahead, you know, sandboxes are um, an interesting response to that. I think they have some promise. I think there's also um, some of our participants were also pointing out um, a need to make sure that they're implemented in an ethical way, right? Because sometimes communities find themselves becoming sandboxes without necessarily having a say um, in that decision being made. But these types of initiatives um, that provide an opportunity to think ahead rather than respond after the fact, um, absolutely crucial. Um, and I think deepening the nature of public participation at all stages of the design process is crucial. Um, and um, I mean, perhaps that even speaks to the broader question of making sure we start by building these kinds of guardrails and institutions that embed democratic norms and democratic processes in the AI technologies that we have now so that they're already in there, right? When we start looking at um, the technologies people like to speculate about coming along the pipeline. I think now it's time to bring in some of the audience questions. So thank you for the questions. Um, we've got them here in the chat. The first one is really around uh, gender imbalances in the design and implementation of AI. And the, the person who was asking the question was looking for some examples of best practices where people are actually succeeding um, in, in creating balance um, in, in AI's development from a gender perspective. Um, I don't know who would like to go first, but I'll open it up, dive in if you have a suggestion of something that's working. I can jump in, uh, since perhaps it's, it's related a bit to the, to, to the problem of gender imbalance, but in general in technological deployment. I think that, like I said, this is a structural inequality problem that is not going to be easily solved because whenever we historically looked at how, at, at how uh, data sets have been built um, in the past, gender has not been uh, a dimension fully, that, that was important when building these this data sets in general, data sets that then uh, train these algorithms uh, who end up doing automated decision-making at different levels. Um, so I think that one potential avenue rather than an example is the one I was mentioning in the beginning. Different civil society organizations and, and academic independent groups are fighting towards more diversity in STEM related disciplines uh, that end up building these systems and building these data sets from scratch. So I think that's an avenue that should be further strengthened. Uh, because we're very far far away from the equality that is desired in these spaces. Um, and perhaps another one, and more from, um, from a short-term, perhaps, solution is a, a bit of what Nati was saying, that Sandboxes is an interesting um, regulatory avenue that could perhaps help mitigating harms to some of these vulnerable communities and decrease perhaps the negative effect that deploying an AI system uh, could have for vulnerable communities that are, let's say, impacted because of this gender imbalance in how data sets and design and implementation of AI has been enforced so far. But just to, to also add to that point, 
whenever we think about um, sandboxes, I think that is very important that the community consultation to that is going to be subject of that sandboxing is very much factored in because so far, and at least in the sandbox debate, and I'm happy that that is also part of what has been mentioned in the report, uh, is that there doesn't seem to be an institutional way in which one consults with a community their desire of being subject to a sandbox that will then feed uh, a broader national implementation of a given technology. And I think that's also an important aspect to have when thinking if the sandbox that is going to be implemented in a given community or in a given group of people is related to vulnerable communities in the first place. Uh, Nadi or Beth, do you have any suggestions here? No, I just wanted to add, and I think it, it uh, because we do have the questions here, I think it kind of also tackles on, on one of the, the other questions that we have um, that has to do with data literacy. Um, of course, the, the lack of women pursuing STEAM fields in higher education is often cited as the reason of, of like why there are so many um, like so many imbalances, gender imbalances in, in technical teams. Um, so I do think that there is like the question goes way beyond just AI. We have to work on on a gender balance in in pretty much the whole uh, technology field, whatever that that means. Like in in, in private sector and civil society organizations, and effort from universities, governments, um, and so the, the question goes beyond that. But just to to um, kind of highlight a few uh, communities that I'm, I'm I'm a part of. There's there's a lot of of civil society organizations working working specifically on women on on AI on women in ethical AI. I'm also part of a community that was born in Latin America that is called Open Heroines, which is all uh, all, uh, all genders welcomed into, into the community, but we all work on tech related um, fields. And, and we actually uh, talk about this and other things uh, that have to do with all, also how to uh, request for better salaries and negotiations that you can go to. Um, and we also share information, reports, events, uh, and pretty much everywhere, everyone is there. So there's a community behind uh, this and, and anyone from around the world can join any of these communities to, to be able to understand what each one can do to add kind of its um, it's small, but really important uh, advocating uh, uh, moment in, in, this, in this discussion. I think it goes well, like beyond just AI. And, and this is a discussion that we've been having for a long, long time now, but it's still important to have. We need to work and still work on, on, getting, um, on getting more, more uh, diversity into every uh, tech related business. Anything you want to add there, Beth, or should we go to the next question? I think it has been uh, comprehensively covered by my fellow panelists. Okay, so our second question, it's around um, personal identifying information. So the sort of thing that should be protected um, through data privacy laws, but often isn't. Uh, and the question is around how to use that personal information responsibly when AI is being developed and how to flag examples um, when an entity is misusing information. So I, th I think maybe the context is, how do you tackle this when there isn't a strong legal framework um, for dealing with it? You know, how do you not ignore it? And how do you work around the fact that there aren't really good legal guardrails sometimes? So maybe I'll throw out a few thoughts um, and then um, some, um, others here who have a little more expertise in this can follow up, but just to um, begin, first of all, um, I think sometimes groups working in settings that do not themselves have strong data protection and frameworks do use the GDPR as a reference point. Um, so that's one thing, right? There are frameworks around data protection, even though the issues raised by AI systems are new. Um, I think there are a lot of different angles to this challenge, and it can, in fact, be very difficult if you're looking from the perspective of a government or civil society entity that's working with a private partner. I mean, to what extent does the contract address who has ownership of the data? Where is it going to be stored? Um, and what can be done with it down 
the road. Um, so unfortunately, I do not have an immediate example of um, kind of this being handled well, but I know it being um, handled insufficiently is a great source of concern um, among the digital rights act activists. Um, I would also just flag one thing that came out of this conversation and other conversations I've been in around AI and data governance specifically is that the line between personally identifiable information and other types of information actually becomes less clear because you have models that are able to take information like your location, right, and then figure out um, who actually this data set belongs to mm -hmm. without having acquired any of the indicators that are traditionally considered personally identifiable information. So um, A, this is a very pressing challenge, but B, I think it's a challenge that needs to be kept in mind when dealing with a really broad swath of types of data about people, not just a discrete category of BII. And if I can quickly jump, uh, Ryan, uh, I think it's also a testament to the importance of how our institutions need to, um, how can I say it in English? Sorry, I lost my, 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 my train of thought. But how can they uh, put themselves uh, and, 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 and create the regulations that are far ahead uh, needed already in our context? And we're talking about here the personal data protection law that doesn't necessarily and will not, of course, be the only solution to the complexity of harms that AI poses, uh, but at least it's a starting point that can also guide these sort of responsibilities uh, and, and how to use data containing uh, private information responsibly in this kind of, of, of data sets. So I think this is one of the biggest questions that we're still quite, uh, as a community, not fully figuring out how that would look like. Uh, but at least we know the things that are still uh, that that are already lacking and that are actually depths far that go way far back to 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 the AI discussions. Uh, I have to make a confession that I didn't notice the third question in the chat, and we've got a couple of minutes left. Nadi, if you can see that there, um, uh, is there anything you want to address on this point about? how to lift data literacy um, so that the non-technical experts get their full voice in these discussions. Yes, and, and I think it goes back to, to what I said. Um, there's like, this goes well beyond AI. It has to do with like data literacy, AI literacy, and, and every um, every technical uh, type of, of literacy. There's a lot of, of efforts being done and uh, hopefully we start to see the results of that. Um, but there, there needs to be like a coordinated effort, both from governments, civil society organizations, multilaterals, investment banks, privacy uh, sector, um, the, sorry, private sector, uh, to actually showcase that these opportunities are real. And that once the data, we get the data literacy a bit um, okay, there's actually room for, for diversity in the decision-making, in the development teams. There needs to be not just the tech, we, need, we do not need to get just the technical bit uh, okay, but we need to shift the culture inside of institutions. And that takes time. And that's why we've been talking about this for a long time. And I do believe that we will keep on talking about this for a long time. And I think that's actually a really quite perfect note to end on. Um, this really is going to require a cultural shift if we're going to not just sort of hold back any authoritarian tendencies, but actually elevate democratic principles within all these systems that are going to be so transformative in our lives. Uh, so on that note, I want to thank you all for joining. I want to thank the National Endowment for Democracy for hosting. And in particular, I want to thank Nati, Eduardo, and Beth uh, for being such a wonderful panel. So thank you all. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thanks so much.